so um, let's uh, let's uh, did I give you one of these? No. Uh, let's just get to it. So um, we actually kind of did the very first thing on here last time, uh, namely. Uh, why is it that the limit of a polynomial is just plugging into the polynomial? Well, why is that, right? If, what's the limit of a constant? That constant value, whatever it is, okay? Not the derivative of a constant, right? Okay, which we'll get there. Um, limit of a constant is itself. Limit of x is... Well, whatever. So, like, if limit as x goes to a of x is a, big shock, right? Uh, and then we also said, well, what happens when you do composition or powers, right? So, if the limit as x approaches a of x is a, what's the limit as x approaches a of x squared? A squared, right? You get to just sort of plug it in. Okay. And then what is a polynomial? Well, it's just a bunch of x to the somethings added together. And maybe there's coefficients, right? But the limit sort of distributes over all of that. So the limit of a polynomial would just be the sum of the limit of all the little pieces, which all work out nice. So great, right? So if you want to take the limit of a polynomial, you can just plug in. That's it. No, no big deal. Uh, but of course, not everything in the world is a polynomial, so womp womp. Um, okay, now, the, the functions that we might have problems with are, are, are examples of things that we might have problems with. So let's look down at the bottom half of the page. So this is numbers two through seven, okay? Um, some of these are going to have potential issues, and what are the potential issues that we should be on the lookout for? What problems might we have? The denominator being zero. Yeah, if we've got a denominator being zero, or even worse, if both the numerator and the denominator are zero. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So that's problem, uh, potential problem. Not always do we run into it, but we will on these. Okay. What other kind of algebraic problems might, might we need have? Yeah. Yes. Square roots of negatives. The square root of zero is okay. But square root of a negative is to propose him. Okay, or at least in calculus class. Uh, it is actually possible to do calculus with complex numbers. Uh, and it's fun. It's really fun. Uh, it's kind of bizarre how some of it works, too. But anyway, uh, you got you have to become a math major to get to get to that club. So um I don't know if you guys, any of you guys watched Seinfeld back in the day, reruns. So there was that episode of, I, I haven't watched much of it, but there's some of them that you just know, like, um, where they're like, they're like in a club or some sort of like, um, like, not like a nightclub, but like a, like a, you know, like a club at the airport kind of thing. Um, and there's progressively more, uh, exclusive rooms that you have to pay progressively more money to get into and they keep going through this like hierarchy of things yeah it's kind of like you know the the calculus of complex numbers club you got to pay more to get there so it, you'll like it champ it'll be awesome okay um <clears throat> okay so square roots of negatives might be an issue what is the the other thing that might be an issue um Depending on the trig function we're dealing with, we might have some problems. So, for example, what's tangent of pi over 2 or tangent of 90 degrees? It's undefined because what is tangent of something? It's sine of the thing over cosine of the thing. Well, if the thing in the bottom, the cosine, is 0, we got a problem. Okay. So, trig functions can have issues like that. Uh, not all of them do. Sine and cosine are perfectly nice, but the other four are kind of annoying. Um, and then the last one, which we kind of have run into, but not tons, uh, would be like, look at number seven. <clears throat> okay, so the logarithm. 
what's the domain of the logarithm function? What are the valid input values? What does the inside of the logarithm have to be? Has to be, yeah, greater than zero. It's got to be a positive input, okay? So you cannot take the logarithm of zero, and you cannot take the logarithm of a negative, okay? Uh, so those are sort of the issues that we'll have to worry about. Okay, now, uh, what's the limit on there on number two? So this was limit x goes to minus one of x plus 10. What can we do here? Yeah, Owen. Yeah, you can just plug in a y. What kind of function is this? It's a polynomial. It's not a particularly exotic one, but it's still a polynomial. Oops, positive nine. Okay. Then the ones where it's going to start to get fun would be, um, or potentially get fun, would be like, let's say, let's look at number three. Okay. What might be worrying us about number three? What X value might we be worried about? X equals two, right? Because that's going to make the denominator zero. And in fact, it would also make the numerator zero, right? But what are we taking the limit as X approaches? Not two, right? So this function is totally cool everywhere, except X equals two. That's the problem child. So if we're approaching a different value than that, we don't really have to worry. We can just plug in in this case. If we're approaching x equals two, then we got a problem, and that's what we'll talk about uh, next. Okay, but we're not. We're approaching three, so we can just, in this case, plug in. Uh, okay, uh, and why can we just plug in? What we're doing, right, is using our limit laws. What do the limit laws say? Limit of a fraction is the fraction of the limits as long as you don't have a zero on the bottom, okay? Um, okay, so um, yeah, so in all of these, you can just plug in, but you can plug in because we're in the good range, or rather, we're in the domain of the function, everything's cool. Okay, so let's actually talk, um, let's go over to the next page, okay, where here we do have the problems that we just encountered, okay? So number eight, you'll notice, is just the same function as number three, except we're approaching two this time instead of three, okay? And we're going to have to do something. All right, so limit as x goes to two of two over x minus one over x minus two. Okay, if I just blindly plug in x equals two, what do I get? Yeah, I get zero on top and I get zero on the bottom. Okay, so here's what I'm going to say. This is, is of the form zero over zero, which is uh, the word we use in this case is in, de well, it would help if I could spell this morning, determine, um, well, okay, let me make some more room here. In the term. Men at. Okay. Sometimes I really hate English. And this is one of those many occasions. Okay. Why am I not charging? There we go. Um, don't need to have a dead laptop. Uh, okay. So it's indeterminate, which is a little bit different than being undefined. And in some sense, it's worse than being undefined. So indeterminate forms. Uh, who knows what they're going to come out to be? And they could come out to be different values in different situations, which is what makes them so annoying, right? So uh, I think I mentioned this last time, pick a number. Any number will do. Four. I can come up with an example where a zero over zero situation works out to have the answer four. Pick another number. I can come up with a situation where it comes out to be that number, right? So we literally have no idea. And like I said last time, this is sort of the equivalent, mathematical equivalent of WTF. Okay. Um, okay, so we can't just plug in. 
The only tool that we have at our disposal, therefore, is some algebra. So let's start algebraing here. What, uh, what options do we have on the table? There's nothing we can factor. Okay, that's unfortunate. But we can do something else. What's a good idea? What's going on in the numerator of this fraction? Hmm? I can't multiply it though. It's just, well, sort of. I mean, I've got two, two fractions on top, right? One of them is a boring fraction, one, but two over X is a fraction. If I wanna put two fractions together, what do they have to have? Same denominator, right? So let's get that. All right, so this guy I can leave alone, but the other one I'm going to write as x over x because isn't that the same as 1? Yeah, and has a denominator of x. Okay, then I can put this together. Okay, and this is one thing I hate about um, when you've got fractions of fractions. Okay, so notice how I drew the big fraction bar sort of ridiculously large. Uh, what am I trying to do here? I'm trying to make sure that I don't screw up the order. Okay, that I know who's being divided by whom. Okay. Um, okay, so we cool up to, to here. We, you know. Now what? Now let's rewrite it and not be silly about how we do so. Okay, so what is it? Let me rewrite it as the limit as x goes to 2 of 2 minus x over x times 1 over x minus 2. Okay, isn't that the same thing? Right, so if I'm dividing by something, in this case x minus 2, is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. Uh, yeah, x, sorry, I'm dividing by x minus 2. What is its reciprocal? 1 over x minus 2. Right? Okay, so by writing it this way, it maybe makes a little bit more clear what, what's true about the relationship between 2 minus x and x minus 2. Okay, so let me highlight those dudes. What's true about those guys? Okay, inverse in which sense? And I couldn't hear. They do cancel each other out almost. And there's the almost. Yeah, exactly. One of them's negative of the other. So when you cancel them, you don't just get one, but rather negative one. All right. Okay. So let's make sure that that's clear. Well, let me write it like this. 2 minus x is negative x minus 2, correct? Oh, God, that looks terrible. Like so? And that's why it's going to be a negative 1 when we cancel, because of that negative that I just factored out. Okay, so this dude cancels with this dude. And now we're taking the limit as x goes to 2 of negative 1 over x. Now, can we just plug in? Do we have any problems? We? No. What, do I need to start, like, injecting caffeine into all of you guys when you walk in the door? Huh? Well, I guess. I'd be maybe a little bit more nervous. I'm not that kind of doctor, 
right? So, uh, all right, so we get negative one half. Okay, um, so the moral of the story on this one is do algebra. Okay, so why don't we take a couple minutes and um, uh, pick either number 10 or number 9. Okay, both of them are going to involve some factoring wizardry. All right, number 9, do you think it'll be that difficult to factor? You have to kind of think about it. What about number 10? Do you guys remember the difference of two cubes? Probably not. Difference of two squares, you won't you probably remember. How did that work? So if I have x squared minus y squared, what is this? Right. Difference of two squares works out like that. Pretty easy. Okay. This is really cool, actually. Uh, what about if I have the difference of two cubes? Nope. <laughs> it doesn't work out that way. Okay. Works out like this. And if you don't believe me, couldn't we foil it out and double check that we get what we're, what I claim that we get? Okay. Um, now, here's what makes this really cool. What about if I put make this one a plus instead? And here's how I remember this. Okay, so I, I taught some high school students over the summer um, for several years while I was in graduate school. And when I showed them this, they're like, oh, it's just soap. And I'm like, excuse me? So here's the pattern. The sign of the first dude is the same as the sign that you start with, right? So when I had minus x cubed minus y cubed, I had an x minus y out front, same sign. The next sign is always opposite of what you started with. And the third one is always positive, soap. I was like, ah, oh, that's very clever. So, yeah. So some teacher of them there said, uh, told them about soap. And uh, now I get to tell you about soap. So anyway. Um, all right, so that's going to be the necessary trick in number number 10. Uh, so take a minute and uh, I don't, you half do number nine and the other half do number 10. Okay, and see what you get. This is the active learning component of, yeah, you guys do number nine. Limit potion number nine. And while you're doing that, I'll commence uh, Go Go Gadget, Dr. McKinney. Uh... And of course, I'm getting annoying emails. All right, so what did we get? Uh, how'd number nine work out? Limit x goes to one of x cubed minus one over x minus one. All right, so how's the top factor? Uh, sorry, number, oh, pff, I'm doing backwards, okay, sorry. would help to go in order. Okay, so this is x goes to seven of x squared minus three x minus 28 over x minus seven. Okay, so what do we get there? Um, x minus seven times x plus four, and then the limit out front. Okay, do you guys agree with the, uh, the factoring? All right, so, um, in this case, it works out relatively clean because 28, what are its factors? 1, 2, 4, and 7. Uh, and 
14 and 28, right? Uh, so it has a bunch of factors, but in this case, four and seven are what we want because what's the sum of negative seven and four? Negative three, which is the other coefficient. And the fact that it's minus 28 tells us that the signs of the two numbers need to be opposite of each other, okay? Uh, and then we need two numbers that add up to negative three. And if we kind of think for a minute, then negative seven and four does the job. Okay, good. Um, all right, so... By doing that, then what can we cancel? The x minus 7 term. And uh, then we're left with the function x plus 4. Okay. Um, and what can we do in that case? Just plug it in because it's now a polynomial and we get 11. Okay, great. Um, so what we're doing here, and there's a theorem at the top of the page, right, is if I were to graph the functions x plus 4, okay, so that was the thing that we got after we canceled, and this, the original fraction, x squared minus 3x minus 28 over x minus 7, okay, so I've got those two things, right, uh, graphically, how do they look? How would they look? Different, but only at really one spot. Okay, so what's the difference going to be on them? They're going to be the same everywhere except x equals 7. Okay, now what's this one look like, x plus 4? That ought to be easy, right? I'll take a straight line for 500, Alex. Yeah. Okay, what's the other one going to look like? Now, it looks all complicated and stuff, and you maybe you're thinking, oh, it's going to be doing like a, this number, and there's an asymptote or some crap, right? But really, what is it going to look like? It's going to be a straight line, except what's going to be going on at x equals 7 for it? It's going to have a hole, okay? So um, the, two, the graphs of these two functions are identical, except for that one point, Okay. And what the theorem says is if you've got two functions that are identical except at that one point, and you're approaching that one point, they will have the same limit. Okay, and why it works is because of, well, like what we demonstrated here, we could kind of cancel away the problem with some clever algebra. Okay, all right, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, all right, same sort of game is going to happen in number 10, except the factoring. Uh, unless we remembered our soap would be a little bit messier. Okay, so what did we get there? It was limit x goes to 1 of x cubed minus 1 over x minus 1. Okay, and then by the, the soap trick, how does the top factor? Other half of the room. Okay, times... 1x, which I'll just go ahead and write it as 1x to be pedantic, plus 1 squared. Okay, same thing there. Okay, so yes, 1x and 1 squared, it's a little silly to write it that way, but I'll leave it like that because that demonstrates the pattern. Okay, okay, Gucci. Okay, now what? Yeah, exactly. The x minus 1's cancel, and now, um, now we're in good shape because what's left is just a polynomial. Okay, so no issues. We can just plug in, and in this case, what do we get? 3. Okay, great. Um, so the same sort of thing would work out here that what's the difference graphically between x cubed minus 1 over x minus 1, okay, so the original function, and x squared plus x plus 1. Well, x squared plus x plus 1 is a what, if I graphed it? It's a parabola of some sort, right? We can figure out where its vertex is and all of that stuff. Um, but if I graphed the other one, x cubed minus 1 over x minus 1, okay, its graph would look the exact same way, except it would have what at x equals 1. It'd have a hole. Okay. 
um, but otherwise they would look the same. Now, that said, if you graph these things, you do have to be a little bit careful because uh, you're, and this is the, think back to high school, right? Your teachers, your calculator will lie to you. Okay, so not always is it even going to show you the whole. Um, so for sake of demonstration, let's uh, actually go over to uh, Desmos real quick. Uh, did any of you guys use Desmos in high school? No? Yes? Okay. It's kind of cool. I wish that they had it when I was in school. But, uh, so what did we have? We had X minus 1 divided by X cubed minus 1. Or no, it was the other way around, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, sorry. Right? Graph it. So where's the potential problem point? At one, which is here. Did it draw the hole? Nope. Okay. So we'd have to kind of use our head to say, oh, well, there's going to be a little bit of an issue there. Okay. Um, okay, good. Uh, now, let's look at number 11, because that one's maybe a little bit more exotic. And let me go back to the... Elgato. So we got limit. X goes to 9 of X minus 9 over root X minus 3. Okay. There are potentially two things that we could do here to sort this out. One of which is maybe a little bit more clever than the other. Okay, so any suggestions? So, could I think of x minus 9 as actually being a difference of squares? What's the square root of 9? 3, okay, so that's not hard. What's the square root of x? Well, the square root of x, right? Okay, so I could actually think about that numerator as being a difference of squares. Uh, and if I did so, it would I would do this. I'd say, okay, get the limit as x goes to 9 of root x minus 3 times root x plus 3. Okay, now, first off, let's double check that I'm not pulling your leg here. Take the thing that I wrote in the numerator and FOIL it back out. Okay? And then collect all the like terms, cancel whatever the cancels, simplify it, and let's make sure that we do, in fact, get back to x minus 9. You will, but double check it. Okay, so being a good mathematician or a student of mathematics, is basically being like the world's most annoying skeptic. You got to call bullshit at every step along the way and be like, nope, I don't believe that. Scribble it out on some piece of paper. Oh, yeah, okay, good. And then do that for the rest of your life. I'm exaggerating, of course, but... You guys should be used to me exaggerating a little bit by now. Uh, especially those minions of you who have had me for... Had me before. And you still come back for more. Now you guys know what the Stockholm Syndrome is, right? All right, so did it work out? Yeah? Okay, so now that I've done that, can I cancel a term here? Totes, right? I could cancel this dude with this dude, and then we're back in the situation that we had before, where, well, the thing that I've got now is not a polynomial, but it kind of is like one. Namely, can I plug 9 into root x without any issues? Yeah, okay, and then I can certainly add 3 to it without any issues. Okay, so what do we get in this case? 
six. Okay, good. All right, what was the, well, let me just write down. Uh, I'm going to need a little bit more space, so let me do that on the next page. Um, are you guys good on this one for me to move on? Raise your hand if you're good with me moving on. Raise your hand if you're not awake yet. <laughs> okay, we're good. All right, so we're going to do the same problem but a different way. Okay, so any ideas what a different approach would be? This one's maybe a little bit sneakier, but it'll come in handy in occasions. Any thoughts? Yeah? Multiply out the... But there's nothing to multiply yet. Yet. <laughs> That's the key. Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply top and bottom by something, right? Now, if I multiply by something over itself, then I haven't actually changed anything, right? So I'm really just multiplying by one, but I'm going to put the one in a funny costume. All right, now the numerator, do we have really any issues with the numerator? Not really, okay? I mean, we could have factored it like we did last time. But um, what else could we do? You guys remember what this trick is called? Champ, do you remember? Okay. S starts with a C. Ends with an E. And it has an conjugate in the middle. Yeah, let's multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. Okay, so what is the conjugate of the denominator? Okay, so when you hear conjugate, what do you think? Well, maybe I shouldn't ask that question. <laughs> um, when you hear conjugate in a math class, let's let's limit our right. What do you think? Right, if I've got like something minus something, then its conjugate is something plus something, right? And typically, we talk about this when we're dealing with complex numbers. All right, but what about here? If I try this. Okay. Now, it doesn't look right immediately like it's going to do anything for me. Okay. But let's multiply things out and see what happens. All right. Now, here's my other rule of thumb when you do this trick. It's not a perfect rule of thumb, but it, it has served me well. Whose conjugate did we use? The denominator or the numerator? The denominator. And in this, this case, the denominator. So multiply out the denominator, but do not multiply out the numerator. Okay, you, th There's nothing wrong with multiplying out the numerator, but if you do, you'll obfuscate what will happen next. Okay, So let's multiply out the denominator, but not the numerator. Okay, what do I get if I multiply out the denominator? I get root x times root x, which is x. I get minus 3 root x. I get plus 3 root x. And I get minus 9. And if I simplify, what do I get? x minus 9 over x minus 9 times root x plus 3. What cancels? And we're exactly back to where we were before. Okay, so uh, there was more than one way to skin the cat in this case. Um, or uh, I really like problems where there's more than one way to do it. Um, so it's kind of like, have you guys ever been to a fancy restaurant? Well, I know it's been a while since we've been able to really do restaurants of any sort. But go to a fancy restaurant and they've got like duck three ways. 
or, you know, steak medallions in three different preparations. You know, one of them's a filet Oscar and the other one's got Bel Blanc. And then the third one is, uh, no. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, I guess you're not as bougie, right? You're college students. Um, well, you know, your parents take you out to a fancy dinner. But no, it's, um, I, I like problems where there's more than one way to do them because they're just intellectually stimulating. So, uh, okay, good. Now, uh, let's talk this squeeze theorem business because that is uh, a non-trivial set of stuff, okay? So what's the idea behind the squeeze theorem? Okay, if you have three functions and they're in order and the outer two functions, the smallest and the biggest, go to the same value, what does the dude in the middle go to? That value. Okay, to apply the squeeze theorem, we need to establish two things. One, that the three functions actually are in the order claimed. And two, that the limit of the smallest and the biggest is the same number. Okay. Now, the other sort of minor problem with squeeze theorem issues is we've often got to figure out what are the two other functions. Okay. But in general, there's some good tricks for that. Okay. So um, let's look at this. This is now on the third page there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and graph this function just so uh, we've got that. Um, oops. Okay, so we got this crazy looking bow tie thing. Um, and let me zoom in a little bit on it just so we can kind of get the idea of what's going on here. So if I was taking the limit as x approaches zero of this, that's sort of the interesting point. Uh, because any other value of x, I can just plug in, right? Because where's the only problem here, algebraically? At zero, right? Because then I would be dividing by zero, and I would get I don't know, and what's cosine of I don't know? Well, still I don't know, right? Any other number? No problem. Uh, okay, so we need to find two functions that bound my function. Okay, so the function that you're dealing with, you want to be the dude in the middle. Okay, and we need to find a function that's bigger than our function and another one that's smaller than our function that also squeeze it. Okay, now the graph here maybe will kind of clue us in what two functions might be good choices. Yes. Uh, right, okay. Absolute x and minus absolute x. Okay, because what's the graph of absolute value of x look like? It would be, let me air graph it. Right? It's kind of like air guitar. No. Come on, guys. Humor me. Eight in the morning. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. Um, all right, and then on the, well, what would the negative of that look like? It would just flip it upside down, right? Okay, so let me throw those two functions in here. Uh, that one, and it's negative. And, uh, okay, it's chosen, let me change the colors on these so that they're a little bit more, um, how do you change the color? I thought there was a way you could do that, but eh, whatever. Uh, all right, so it's a little hard to see, but um, on the projector, original graphs in blue, absolute X is the dude in green, negative absolute X is in sort of this dark blue or purple color, whatever, and notice that the function is squeezed between those, okay? So what we're really using here, oh, and I forgot to go over to the full screen for that. That's what the graph looks like for those of you who are online, and we'll go back to the Elgato. Okay. Um, all right. So algebraically, uh, what is true about cosine of x? Okay. So not cosine of 1 over x squared, right? Just plain old ordinary 
garden variety cosine. Yes. It's always between negative 1 and 1, exactly. Okay. And same thing's true for sine, by the way. Okay. So if that's true, what is true about this? It's also bounded between negative 1 and 1. You might say, oh, well, wait a minute, Dr. McKinney, what about zero? Well, can I plug in zero? No, so it's not relevant, okay? All right, so no matter what you're taking sine or cosine of, the value that'll come out of that is always between negative one and one. And it is, uh, it could be equal to negative one or one, um, but it's, it's between those two things, okay? So it's, uh, that's why I've got less than or equal to's. Okay, so if that is true, can I multiply all three things by absolute x? Yeah, okay. Okay, so I've got that now. So from the first step to the second step was realizing, well, it doesn't matter what you plug in a cosine, it's still going to work. The second step to the third step is to say, well, can I multiply by the same thing everywhere, right? Multiply all three sides, if you will, by the same quantity. Yeah, totally. That's algebra, right? Uh, okay, well, notice what we got here. What's the dude in the middle? Yeah, it's our original function, and we've got him squeezed between two values, okay? But we need to make sure that the squeeze gets squoze. Okay, what am I referring to there? Come on, are you guys keeping up with the news? Have you not been following GameStop stock and that whole thing, the short squeeze? Really? Yeah, there's a short squeeze, and people are asking, and this is the language that they're using online because it sounds funny, to know if the squeeze has happened, and so they're saying, is has the squeeze been squoze? And it, it, I don't know. I just thought that was amusing. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I actually asked, do you, any of you guys know Dr. Dunaway uh, in economics? Those of you who want to do economics... No, you said you want to get to know this guy because he's awesome. And he, uh, he explained how the whole thing is working. Cause I was just like, I, I did not understand how short selling worked. It didn't make sense that this is a thing, but whatever. Uh, okay. So we've got the inequality, but that's not yet enough. We need to make sure that, like I said, the squeeze gets squoze. So what I need to do is check that this and this, those need to come out to the same value, okay? And if they do, that's the second part of the squeeze theorem that I need, okay? Now, do they? Yes, okay, what do they both come out to? Zero. Or, I'm sorry, it was cosine. Okay. Okay, so the squeeze theorem using it is a sort of a Texas two step, right? You need to make sure that you have two functions that bound your given function of interest. And oftentimes, it's up to you to figure out what those functions are. Um, if the thing you're dealing with has a trig function in it, then that maybe gives you a clue as to where to start thinking. Okay. All right, so establish that you've got a bounded uh, function, and then make sure that the squeeze is actually squoze.
okay? Namely, that the two bounded, bounding functions approach the same value. And if you got both of those things, then the squeeze theorem applies. Okay, now, the thing on the very back page uh, is uh, it's kind of quick. Um, <clears throat> look at the theorem there, so it's that box. There's some special limits, um, which uh, take them on faith, basically, for now, okay? Uh, we will need those limits um, later uh, to do some stuff, okay? So in particular, the very first one you can actually prove with the squeeze theorem, but it's a little trickier than you might think. Uh, the book does have a proof of it. The other three, just tr take it on faith for right now, okay? <clears throat> All right, Gucci. All right, let me go get the uh, things. We'll quit the stream. I'll hand back those papers and see you guys on Friday.